Simon has shown in countless shows all over the world and has works collected by major museums such as M Plus, Kiddist Foundation, National Museum of Art Osaka, and our very own Singapore Art Museum. He also has a very busy few years ahead with a solo exhibition lined up this year at UCCA Dune, as well as a solo next year with the Singapore Art Museum. As well, we're very happy to have with us the curator for the show, Brian Kwan Wood. So, Brian is a writer based in New York and an editor of the E-Flux book series and monthly journal. With Freya Cho and Reem Shadid, he curated the still ongoing Taipei Binale 2023 title, It's a Small World. So, that show ends in March this year. If anyone is going to be in Taipei, please check that out. Yeah, many, many programs lined up as well, I believe. And since 2015, he taught at the MA Curatorial Practice Program at the School of Visual Arts in New York, where he was the Director of Research from 2017 to 2022, among his other many wealth of experiences. As for the show, Meditations on Shadow Libraries, this is actually Heeman's second solo exhibition with us, with the first being Peace, Prosperity and Friendship with All Nations in 2021, curated by Kathleen Ditzig. As an exhibition, Meditations on Shadow Libraries is both like a single giant artwork by Heeman and a set of open individual works through which multiple objects, experiences and ideas might pass. So without further ado, I'll pass the time over to the duo. Thanks, Siwa. Thanks so much, Siwa. Thanks also to everyone at STPI for um, their great hosting generosity um, in the past uh, few weeks. Thank um, Emmy. Thank Emmy. And 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 Emmy, you, uh, definitely. Um, meditations on shadow libraries. Um, Yes, uh, also thank you for reminding me before we began that there are, uh, maybe I should just mention, there are two works, uh, the kind of, uh, what do they call it, in, uh, like a like an Easter egg or something in a film, a little hidden secret. There are two works, um, The Book of Drafts um, and Memories, which are not uh, hung on the wall, uh, not present in the exhibition space at the moment, um, which you should know about. One exists only in the publication for the exhibition, the Book of Drafts. Memories is a performance, which happens uh, over here. There's a wall text for it, um, but it is, uh, it, it, at the moment, its presence is uh, ghostly. And these kind of ghostly presences um, in the exhibition, I think, also reflect a general kind of interest in other ghostly presences uh, relating to, uh, to books, to publishing, uh, to printing but also to thinking and understanding. One might say even the relationship between uh, the strange, the kind of uncanny relationship between what we understand as information and what we understand to be knowledge. How, do, how does text, how is text stored, retrieved? How is knowledge stored and retrieved in books, in our bodies? How does it pass from our bodies to other bodies? from our bodies to objects like books. How does it sit there? Um, how, does it, how is it retrieved? How is it, how is it moved? What is the kind of, um, how do we understand the, the life that information and knowledge have also beyond our own minds and our own comprehension? Um, this is something that I think runs through the, the exhibition and takes different forms in which Heeman is always sort of approaching and surprising um, uh, really surprising ways from work to work. And I would encourage you to keep this in mind um, uh, when you view the exhibition. Um, I apologize to also some of you who have seen our uh, tours and things earlier if there are some repetitions. Um, but I think it's really important to, to begin with the title of the exhibition, Meditations on, on Shadow Libraries. Shadow libraries are both uh, 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 extremely widespread, but also kind of kind of obscure uh, themselves. And I wonder, uh, Heeman, if you could tell us about um, the title and about shadow libraries themselves, and as and how it influenced and, and inspired the exhibition. I mean, I I remember from a very young age that a lot of the books that I have encountered as a child were actually photocopied versions of books because I think 
publishing and, and distribution in the 80s in Singapore wasn't so prolific. So a lot of the books that I wanted was actually only available on like um, the pirated sort of market. Um, so there was a lot of like sharing of books by photocopying friends' books. And sort of that idea has always sort of stuck with me, which is to really, you know, sort of think about what it means to informally exchange knowledge and information between people and what does what that entails uh, within society itself. Um, I think it happens a lot in the global south that people do a sort of like, you know, bootleg books for other people. I think in today's context, it's become extremely prolific to find like online shadow libraries where people have extensive PDFs of like hard to find journals. And uh, I also discovered that actually many academics, they secretly trade, you know, their scholarly writings because there are just too many databases to have to like subscribe to. So it's always easier if you just like ask for something directly from somebody, then it's, you know, you sort of circumvent that legality mm -hmm. that you're stealing the article. If, if the author of the article sort of gave it to you, it's fine. So there's all these things that um, contribute to a lot of how I think about my work, which is really about circulation and transmission and redistribution. Um, I suppose uh, we can always start by talking about the library of unread books. Is that in the second question? No. Maybe. But <laughs> no, no harm in, in jumping to it. OK, so the the, what you're sitting in is actually a project that uh, Renee Stahl and I began in 2016. Renee is here. Um, so what we've done is to, we started the library by asking our friends um, for books that they have bought or they have, but they have never read. So it's a very simple way of transforming an object that belongs in like within the realm of private property into the realm of the public commons. So we sort of run this itinerant library that is a library in a given space and people can come and read books. We can't lend out the books because we don't have the administrative power to get the books back once we've loaned them out. It's very difficult. Um, so right now, they, I think we have about like thousands of books in the library and it's also in different parts now because we've split the library up so that different institutions could work with them. So actually, one edition is, it belongs to the Singapore Art Museum and the, another edition belongs to a private collector in Penang. His name is Kuang Yi. Alfred is here. We've shown it in their space in Penang, which makes me very happy because like in Penang, there's no, uh, it's very difficult to have access to a proper library. So it f really functions very well as a real library. So I think it's an artwork that has uh, a kind of, uh, yeah, like a sense of realism, you know? That's, it's not a fake library. It's not like you could only look at the books. In fact, you could spend a whole day going through the library and reading. So the, 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 the actual books themselves are touched and it sort of doesn't res resist that kind of like destruction. Sometimes we have to repair the books. So it's, it's pretty much a real library in that sense. Uh, and a very personal one because like uh, the library is always displayed on these tables and uh, these books are stacked like this, you know. Um, the stacking is important also because people, are, I feel like people are more open to like touching the books and sort of playing with the books rather than having shelved books, you know? So it's a bit like a structural thing. So we're always encouraging people to like spend like a day in the library and to, I think it's always also very special to come into like a gallery to read. I think it's a very different experience from like going to a library library. So 
The last time it was installed, it was for the Singapore Biennial and they had found like a little shop for us in the International Plaza. And that worked very well because it functioned as public art because people during like lunch hour would like go to the library to read and which was a very beautiful gesture, I thought. Uh, it's currently also installed now in SEMA in the Seoul Museum of Art in, and um, in, it's part of a kind of like a museum setting which is also very different. So it has all this sort of like possibilities to sort of wrap around a space and we sort of function like an aphetite. You know what an aphetite is? It's like a plant that clings onto another plant. Uh, but it's not a parasite, you know, it just hangs onto it and derives its nutrients from the air, like a fern, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's more or less kind of like the heart of this exhibition, which is this sort of massive social sculpture, sort of public program, weird chimera of a, of a thing, you know. Yeah. Maybe I'll add also a note on 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 shadow libraries because piracy yeah. is another pi piracy is is a kind of a minor uh, theme in in the exhibition. Yeah. But with of course the shadow libraries are often accused of uh, of of pirating uh, 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 intellectual property. Sure. But then with many of these uh, more academically driven uh, shadow libraries, the criticism is also that they are also expropriating uh, publicly funded research, right, which they, when they publish it and add uh, intellectual property uh, to it, they're actually taking a publicly funded uh, resource uh, from universities and then, and then locking it down. So then there's a strange justice also to, to releasing it back, uh, back into the world again, but it's, mm. it's of course illegal and punishable. Of course. I think this is uh, also something that, that um, a question that, that um, the Library of Unread Books kind of inverts uh, a number of times in the way that it, mm. it, it's both very institutional and very uh, open yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Um, there is also uh, the, the series of works behind us, yeah. a labyrinth, which deals in a much uh, a more, deals with a much more regimented uh, mm. um, uh, 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 arrangement of, of yeah. library bookcases or bookshelves mm. uh, or, 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 or computer uh, 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 kind of processor uh, yeah. topology. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about um, how this work relates yeah, to books? So it's like a series of paintings that I've been working on for the past two years. And a lot of them, I mean, it's pretty simple, which is from this perspective, it looks like books on a shelf. And these pathways are just like sort of like, you know, the pathways between knowledge the systems. But from far, it also looks like data sets for me. So like blocks and chunks of data. So I think formally, um, yeah, that, they function as abstract paintings, I guess, you know, in systemically. And uh, I've always also been very interested in sort of like thinking about this series as a series of paintings that's always hiding another painting. So if you look carefully, there's always something else that's hidden under that. So I think a lot of it is also me thinking about these layers of things that I'm thinking about, which has particular structures and particular meanings to them. And uh, it is, it is a, a very obvious sort of extension of my previous series, which is called Cover Versions. It's like the book covers that I've done. Um, I'll show you an image of it like this. Um, so it's a series that began in 2009 where I had started to paint like book covers as a way of like entering painting. So I think I often think of like my painting practice as a kind of floating world in my, in my everyday life. And a lot of it is not cerebral and a lot of it is really about like using my hands and there's a sort of dexterity involved in learning to paint and learning to sort of produce this uh, visual structures on the surfaces of things. 
So this, yeah, a kind of, you know, uh, a very visceral sort of like connection for me. Because at the end of the day, uh, a lot of my sort of processes revolve around like thinking about systems more than anything else, yeah. I think um, these, these also look like kind of master plan. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, um, like maps. Like maps. And, and I think oh, um, when fascist, fascist cities. Right, exactly. <laughs> like Manhattan. <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> An Excel spreadsheet, basically, yes, in a, yes, as, yes, a, yes. As, a, as a city. Yeah. Um, I think Rem Kulhas actually pointed this out. Uh, pointed this out. Oh, no. Um, Kulhas. But then there's another, um, it sort of begs the question of yeah. also. Um, um, also, thinking about the, the room over here, about how about this being an exhibition of works that you are doing in yeah. your own home yeah. uh, in Singapore, where you live, yeah. where you grew up. Yeah. So there's also a certain kind, there's a certain intimacy yeah. um, that you might have when producing a, um, a, a, an exhibition here. And the works yeah. in, in, in this room uh, tend to also deal with... Um, with uh, building and planning in Singapore, but also with a very strong moods and, and feelings uh, yeah. about changes and, and uh, disasters and, uh, and uh, uh, over, uh, uh, upheavals in the, yeah. in the city. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Mm. I think one of the reasons why I continue to live in Singapore and not anywhere else is because I find it very a very productive thing to work in the place that I would think of as home. Um, that's one. Number two is uh, I find it very, very inspiring to live under uh, a master plan because, you know, it's about somehow navigating myself in a way that does not adhere to the master plan so much. Um, so there is a lot of, for me, um, I'm interested in this sort of slippage that I could engage with in Singapore, um, with, with my work, also with my life, to sort of not, you know, stick to that plan as much as possible. Um, I think strategically as well, uh, a lot of my work is shrouded in metaphor, even the paintings, you know, like the idea of having one painting hiding another painting. There's always a sense of secrets in my work. Um, I think also because that there really is a kind of sensibility over the years that whilst I do not condone censorship, it is a reality I have to deal with and I shouldn't use up all my credits with a single project. Um, so there are all these layers involved that uh, somehow really inspire me to produce in the way I produce, um, which um, almost always starts by asking all these questions about one's position within Singapore as an artist? Like, what is the position of an artist in Singapore? Is there a political function for artistic work? You know, like, and, and if, if there is, like, where do we locate this artistic work? How does it um, manifest itself as a part of society in Singapore? And if, and, and who are the players in defining these manifestations, you know? So, um, again, I think a lot about systems and the sort of like ways of working within that system. So, it's funny because like a lot of people will come to my solo shows and they will also think like, why does it always look like a group show? <laughs> um, because I, I really don't work in a single way and it's always a kind of way that is tangential, tangential, I think. 
So sometimes it can get confusing. Even for myself, I find myself confusing um, because I do not attempt to clarify like the production before it's made. It's one of the reasons why I find it very difficult to apply for grants because like, I have to finish the project before I actually make the project, you know? I have to like write about it. And you know, in, in writing about it, you finish the work, you know? So it's something that I, I, I find difficult to cope with. So a lot of my projects always start without that process, without understanding what is it I'm doing. And I think some curators get really upset with this because uh, I, I have had emails telling me not to make things up as I go along. <laughs> but I, it's just the way I work, you know? I'm, like, I'm sort of like improvising the work as I'm sort of in it. That's why we memorized this whole talk before. This is actually a <laughs> fully, uh, 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 we're just playing back the we're talk. We're just very our... prepared with this talk. Yeah. So this is the, yeah. You can see it here. It's I think also there are um, there are a lot, a lot so many playful um, inversions and 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 codings, right? So when we, uh, I was talking earlier about the the different ghostly presences yeah. in 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 the exhibition, but actually, yeah. uh, uh, maybe I just stole that from you because you were describing actually this this room here with eternal returns and and still building yes. as the room of of ghosts, but then yes. still in the room of ghosts uh, and then extending here to oleanders to, to this yeah. video you have um you have bookmarks leaves you have these very very sensual uh, um, encounters uh, yeah. with uh with books as as material objects um so if you enter this space here later you will see this the first work that you encounter is a work called eternal returns it's a kind of shadow library that i've been building since 2017. And what I've done is something very simple. Like on Instagram, I would like just like have a post that says, if you have lived somewhere in Singapore where that building or that house has been demolished, please write me your name and that address of that place that has been demolished, you know? So it becomes a kind of like an address of a ghost of an a piece of architecture. So I'm very interested in not so much the building itself, because I'm not interested in architecture. Like, I'm not interested in fashion, as you can see. Um, so I'm not interested in like, how the architecture looks, but I'm very interested in who has lived there and the, 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 the actual sort of text about the building, which is the address, like for Jalan something, something, you know? And uh, I think by sort of like encrypting this name and address uh, onto paper and onto different material, it provides a way to think about why we are constantly like unblocking our buildings, you know? Like why are we constantly destroying these cultural artifacts that we've lived in before, you know? So it's, it's, it does look like a bit of a columbarium on the other side, yeah. And then, um, there's also another project in that room, which is called Bookmarks Leaves, which I just, it's a very simple project. I, for a very long time, I've collected leaves that have been found in pub, like library books around the world. And I've just made them into these sort of ghostly representations of these leaves as a kind of way of they look like uh, sponges that have soaked up like whatever that's in the book a little bit. So it's a bit romantic, the work, you know. And there's a third series, which is a series of paintings called Still Building, and the title of the work refers to a play written by Haresh Sharma. And it was about the New World Hotel collapse. And it's a very sort of beckoning sort of play where there's like three figures trying to escape the rubble so like um, by, by painting over these name cards, you know, they sort of look like bricks and rubble and, you know, like brick and mortar sort of thing. So again, again, it's really about sort of like drawing out these things um, that one might forget. So there's, 
you know, like that painting over there in the room is from Elfin Saad's A History of Amnesia. So it's kind of like a thing, you know, that runs in the, in the, in the exhibition as well, like a series of rememberings and forgettings, you know. Um, the, the medium of, of memory is also uh, a very important uh, part of this and I think is, is, um, is, is most vividly expressed by one of the works I brought up earlier, which is not, uh, doesn't physically appear in the show right now because it's yeah. a performance called Memories. Um, which, um, Don't worry, keep going. Which uh, um, uh, is a performance of where uh, um, unpublished works of Hemans, short stories of, of his that I think you, you don't uh, really like and don't really find very publishable, have they find their own their only place where they are allowed to be published is in the minds of people who memorize them, and. Uh, so it's a kind of excruciating, uh, a punishing exercise that people volunteer for, memorizing uh, uh, short stories that you, you, that you are not even very satisfied with. Um, and, 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 and this, is a, a, this is, I think, also has a very uh, powerful ghostly presence and is, and is strangely about uh, almost a kind of uh, 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 another form of publishing, a kind of a uh, cerebral uh, uh, imprint <laughs> or uh, psych psych psychological uh, pu publishing. I just like to start by saying that unlike making artwork, unlike painting, writing is like the most difficult thing for me. Like I, I, I actually I'm terrible at it, but I often. I often do it because I'm also in love with it. So that's a very difficult relationship I have with it. So like when I sit, I find like that, that simple text document with that flashing, you know, cursor thing. It's like totally fascist, you know. Um, having said that, uh, of course, over the years, after writing for so long, you, one learns techniques, you know, it's a bit like swimming. You know, if you have swam for 10 years, you would know how to swim, you know. So, um, but at the same time, like when I read my, my writing, it's, uh, it's a bit painful as well because I know that's not great. And uh, I don't really want to see it published, especially for my short stories, because it's embarrassing. But I also, you know, at the same time, I, I'm, so, I'm so vain, right? So I want to like release it into the world. So I thought of this idea, this is a, this is a piece that I came up with uh, for a show next door at 7213. It was part of the Flying Circus project. And it was developed in relation, in sort of collaboration with, uh, kind of in collaboration with the French choreographer Boris Kamatz. So what we decided to do was really to produce a system which is to utilize performance as a publishing platform. So I'm literally like publishing the work. And uh, before the performance starts, I would tell the audience, mem the participant, that uh, I have promised, I personally promised them that I will never publish this short story and that the only way to read this short story is to memorize it word for word. And you're not allowed to leave the room until you've memorized it. <laughs> It's, it's painful because like uh, I've seen people do it and I just want to cry. Like, uh, yeah, it takes about three hours to memorize it. Some people took six hours. It's horrible. Uh, yeah, so I, oh. I've also started to write the stories in a way that would be easier to memorize. So there's sort of like better rhythms and things like that, blah, blah, blah. So it's more like a script. And the, the personal, I always call them the personal trainer because it's like going to the gym. So the trainer is always like an actor or an actress because actually actors and actresses are very good in helping their friends like memorize stuff. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of similar to the library of unread books. It's kind of like a weird cross between like performance and 
community art project cross a public program for a museum. So for example, it was very, very popular when the National Museum of Art in Osaka collected the work. There were like people, there were like queues for it, you know. And I was like, wow, this level of torture. <laughs> the sadomasochism with people is unbelievable. Um, it's something that I, I, I really enjoy doing out, that sort of grew out of all this sort of like extremely embarrassing things. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I also think of it as a shadow library because like the minute you would memorize this short story, like the next day you will almost forget it. So it's kind of like a shadow in your mind. Sometimes people would text me lines from my own stories on Instagram and I'll be like, what is this, you know? Yeah. It's also, I think, quite, um, quite. Uh, uh, this is a, a kind of completely un, un, unusual honesty that you that you have towards feelings about your own writing, yeah, uh, terrible. feelings about um, um, about act, the really painful act of writing in general. Um, but then it opens up a very strange and interesting space in between complete works and uh, yes. uh, released works, published yes. works, but also um, uh, works that you yourself uh, decide are complete yeah. and works that are just, uh, that are suspended as, as, as just strange experiments or, or ideas. And this is a very interesting um, yeah. uh, place where a lot of, uh, where a few works, especially in this exhibition, kind of hang, suspended yeah. memories is, is one of them. Uh, the book of drafts, as as uh, as we were saying earlier, uh, which is in the in the publication. But then there is yeah. also um, this large uh, 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 um, wallpaper uh, work in work in the back works on, on yeah. paper, which is a which is a, an unrealized, a completely unrealized uh, project. Yes. Also dealing with uh, um, with pirated uh, with piracy. Um, I'd like to first start talking about a work that you can only find in the catalog. It's called The Book of Drafts. And it started as a short story that I had written for a book that's published in London in 2017 uh, with the artists Maria Taniguchi, Benjamin Soria, ja Travis Jefferson, and Isabel Nolan. And so it's like a book of like artist writing. So, you know, I, you know, artist writings are not easy to read because they don't usually follow like the conventional three act play. You know, there's always, you know, like the idea of that's of a climax or a conflict. And most of the time it rambles, you know. So um, I, grew, I grew very interested in expanding that first short story into an idea for a novel and that I wanted this novel to be always published in fragments. So for example, then, then essentially uh, at this point of time, I've written about eight, eight fragments of the novel. So they function like chapters. So for example, like there's one chapter that is commissioned by uh, SF MoMA in San Francisco, where it's for their blog, you know? So I, I guess it, for me, I'm, I'm comfortable in splitting up sets of writings that could never be connected in, you know, as a whole. It also some, somehow could, um, it also, it's also important to note that it's very much related to the narrative inside the book of drafts because it's about, the narrative is about a writer from Singapore and her name is Anna, Anna O, oh, and every chapter begins with this one sentence, which is Anna wakes up. So this, it's really about political awakenings, like well, the novel. Uh, so Anna wakes up and then she does this thing, this thing in the day. And the central thing, the central theme of each chapter would be always this question, like why do I write? And uh, what, is, what is this writing for? You know, who reads this writing? 
you know, like, does this person, does, do, the, do the people who read this writing, like, even, could even sort of have a relationship with this writing? So there's uh, all these fundamental questions about being a writer is a part of the narrative. And I thought that if I have, if I, I thought that it's almost like a, a, a kind of monument to like a lot of the artists in Singapore who have given up being artists because it's very difficult being artists in Singapore. And that if I don't stop writing this novel, then Anna never makes up her mind. She never stops because I, I, you know, the novel never ends. You know? So it's kind of like conceptually, I think that works very well for me. Um, which brings us to like the last work in the show, which is uh, this work, which you will see in that room. Sorry, it's a bit bright, so it's hard to see. Um, it's a project called Notes on Roads, Trips, and Other Possible Slips and Falls. And I had tried to work with many different institutions before about this project, where I wanted to run a pirate cinema in a city, in a given city, for a year. So like 365 days, 365 road movies in 365 different locations. So these locations could be like someone's home or like a cafe or like, you know, like a small cinema, blah, blah, blah. So, but all the films have to be illegally downloaded from any one of the sites or, you know, like streamed or whatever. So it's a kind of a, strange thing where you, you know that it's online, it's accessible, but you would like go somewhere to watch it with somebody. So it's a kind of communal experience that I've always wanted with strangers. But every time I try to make this project, like it just fails. Like uh, I worked on it on, for three years with an institution in New York and then COVID arrived, you know? And then uh, there was an institution that like totally like pulled out because they were afraid of like, the sort of like the backlash, you know, like, uh, you know, having an institution like piss off 365 film directors, you know, by screening like pirated copies of their films. It's like a sure highway to hell, you know. So um, I, I have decided to just make posters of the films, of the different films, and to sort of like create a kind of wall, the wall of shame almost. <laughs> um, and that this poster could be a kind of monument to this grand failure that keeps recurring in my life, you know? And that it's going to be like a public shaming process where it's going to be sort of installed as a public artwork, you know? I really think of it as a public artwork that, uh, I mean, the best possible scenario for this is to have it on the hoarding of some terrible construction site, you know? Um, and then there's the last work, which is you can see here. So it's also me trying attempting a shadow library um, by. So this is these are photographs taken with a very high resolution camera uh, during three days of walking around in the Met in New York, and I had photographed every painting that had a book in it. So there are like hundreds and hundreds of books that I found in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings. So it sort of forms like a kind of a landscape of like the history of painting books within the mat. Of course, it's a, it's a very fractured, you know, like a, what do you call that? Tunnel vision history. Um, and I, it's actually, it was actually made for a commission for the Lahore Biennial, which would happen in October. And instead of a big screen in Lahore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this Im these images and I'm going to make bootleg postcards from the mat and I'm going to slip them into secondhand books that people would sell on the streets in Lahore. So people would, you know, who buy the books would get like a free gift from the mat, which is like, you know, totally crazy. Uh, yeah. That pretty much... Um I think we covered uh, actually everything, everything. except yeah. the peppered uh, uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, um, I don't think we works, have to go. Which, we, which can just be enigmatic. <laughs> enigmatic. So let's let's um, 
let's stop there and and turn the microphone to you uh, in case there are any questions. We'll take three questions and okay. they have to be questions. They're not opinions. Not proclamations. Compliments? Yeah. No, no, compliments. no compliments. Questions. Anyone? I don't. Yes. I did talk to the Met about it, and they says if I sell the postcards, they'll sue me. <laughs> so my, my, my uh, response always to things is to not do it. Or like, uh, you know, I don't want to fight it because also I... There's another thing that's quite important about my practice, which is that I don't work with assistants. I'm like a one-man machine in my little HDB flat. And all the work that you see around you... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do whatever you want in museums now because museums are like, please Instagram me! You know? Yeah, yeah. You could like do a whole music video and no one would bat an eyelid in museums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's totally true. Oh, thank you. I, for me, it's like, I, to be honest, again, I don't really know what I'm doing. Like, I've just started this project, so I'm kind of still processing it. So I'm like, oh, a screen, let's try a screen. Oh, postcards, let's try a postcards, you know? So I'm just testing. For me, because for me, the exhibition is always a site of testing. And also because I'm shameless, so I'm not scared of being embarrassed, you know, with failures or mistakes. Um, so I'm always using the exhibition as a kind of like, test ground for things, uh, which sometimes can be very risky, but I, I don't care. Um, what else can I say about myself? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Robin. Wait, wait, wait. They can't hear you. Um, you love to work in these big ongoing series, right, with uh, lots of works that go on for decades and repeating, you know, paintings, writing projects. At what point do you decide that you're done with something? Uh, do you ever get bored of the seriality? And is there an end point to these kind of ongoing things that you're doing? Uh, it's a very good question. And the, the very simple answer to your question is the end point is always exhaustion. So, for example, I did this project once, which is called Calendars 2020 to 2096. It's a work where I had spent like seven years photographing uh, interior spaces in Singapore which are publicly accessible. And there's a rule to it. There are several rules to the project, which is number one, when I photograph the, the, the interior, there must be no one in it. But I cannot use speech to create this empty image. So I cannot like, hey, uncle, uncle, siam jie, huh? <laughs> so I cannot tell them to like fuck off or whatever. So I would just wait around with my camera in this space until, you know, that's one moment, one second when it's empty, then I will take the shot. So there are some scenes which are very beautiful, but it's just full of people, right? And I would just like wait for like hours upon hours for this thing to empty out. So uh, I shot about 6,000 spaces, and then I was like, Bleh. like, you know, I can't do it. I can't shoot another interior space in Singapore, you know? So I think exhaustion is something that always ends a project because uh, I literally like, you know, like I can't do it. So for example, I'm making a new piece for my show in UCCA and Sam and the Serpentine, which is that I, for five years now, I've been walking the perimeter of Singapore, like the border, you know, like round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And I've been taking photographs of like whatever you would find on the very edge of Singapore and that, and I can't photograph the sea because then Charles Lim will hate me. I can't photograph the forest because then there's like Zunian tiger ground. <laughs> so like all I could photograph is like the road, like all the shit that's on infrastructure, right? So it's like pain. 
Then uh, one day I was just walking along the perimeter and I just could not photograph it. I was like, Bleh! you know, like literally I wanted to vomit. And that's the end of the project, you know? So it's a very, bod it's a very bodily response to like the end of something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's very, yes, yes. So her question is like, what is the starting point of the project, right? It's very simple. It's always a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, wow, you know, like I would, I'm like a very avid sort of like reader of Wikipedia and uh, of like trivia, trivia. So like I would be very sort of inspired by like weird tidbits about the world, you know? So uh, that's one, that's one. But I guess, uh, jokes aside, um, it is the same process that I am engaged in when I'm thinking about my work, which is the, to, to, to accumulate ideas. So like, uh, I think the arch in my practice is really about collecting, collecting ideas. So I, I have like, thousands of little, little folders on my desktop where they're just like one-line notes, like a uh, project about relationship between CIA and cats, or you know, like stuff like that, you know? <laughs> like project about this, like, uh, you know, so. And every year I would like drag them into a folder that's, that says Z, 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 which is like, no, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine, um, William, William de Roy, the Dutch artist, he has another way around this, which is beautiful. So he, has, he keeps a collection of titles for works before whatever the work is. So he has a, he has a little booklet. Every time you will say something, he's like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, it's like constantly stealing people's words. And the titles, he tells me like, it's from the title that the work germinates, you know? So for me, it's always like a sort of accumulation of like, yeah, little stories, little stories around me, yeah. That's three questions. I know. I have, I have kind of a bonus one yeah, that we bo can... Bonus, yeah. okay. bonus, bonus question? Bonus okay. round. Speaking of your, your apartment, I want to ask you about between uh, master planning, yeah. uh, regimentation, yeah. rules, and, uh, and chaos, how do you... How do you organize your space? My wife said re recently, oh. observed, because her sister and her husband are writers. Yeah. And she observed that writers live a really messy because they deal yep. with this fascist uh, prompt uh, uh, of, of the page. They have to create order on the page. And so they live like uh, pigs. But artists, she, sa she said, I don't know if this is even true. She said, artists uh, deal with chaos in their work, and so their space has to be very, very uh, ordered and, and regimented oh. and sober. Uh, and you are always, in, in your works, you are always yeah. moving, uh, yeah. uh, charting Things. different paths between these orders. How, how, how is your, what's your apartment like? It's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I mean, I tell this to my therapist, and he's like, what? You know, like this. I tell him, I tell him I have a little room. So whatever I cannot deal with, whether it's like a letter from the government or whatever, I will just like not look and throw it into this room. <laughs> it's like the ad of my sub like like fiscal ad of my subconscious. So yeah, terrible. Mm. So order in the work then. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean I think my work is very structured because I think I like to communicate well to people, but I think in my personal working space, it's total alles kaput. Thank you, Shun. Bitte. Human. Thank you, human. <laughs> Weird ending. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much to both Heeman and Brian and to everyone here as well for joining us today. I think we all enjoyed that conversation very, very much. So just to let everyone know as well, we have a very wonderful catalogue to accompany this exhibition. It's available in our corner shop right behind and it contains a really compelling essay by Brian about the idea of shadow libraries in relation to Heeman's works. Yeah, 
as well as reproductions of essays by Anka Rujoyu, originally published in Leap magazine, as well as by Lawrence Liang, originally published in Eflux. So in line with the idea of shadow libraries, the catalogue is actually designed in a way where the entire original object has gone through a photocopier once, our own office photocopier actually, with the photocopied version being the one that's printed out and bounded in this version for circulation. So I highly encourage you to check this out. Lastly, we just have one slot left for the performance memories on 24th February Saturday. The one that Heman mentioned, that's quite painful to go through. So if you know anyone that would be game or if you yourself would like to try that out, please check it out on our website and sign up. Yeah, so that's all I have for you today. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. There, there are also three other books available that uh, I've published in the book corner shop. The first is a book that's edited by Pauline Yao, who is the, sort of the senior curator at M Plus, and it's sort of a retrospective book about my practice, uh, like a survey book. The second book is a pub book that will be published for my previous show at SDPI. And the third book is a book published about the Library of Unread Books by Jamil Art Center. So please have a look at the books. They are crucial to my practice. Thank you everyone for turning up on a weird Wednesday afternoon.